one and can be found on pages 75 and 76 in your New Testament pew Bibles. The rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm. It has been fixed so that there that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is God's word to us. Thank you, honey. (laughs) Word of God for which we give thanks. Will you pray with me, please? God, pour out your spirit upon us now as we listen to this parable from Jesus. May it speak to us and help us to um, learn more about who we are and who we're called to be as people of God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is the the second uh, in a series, if you will, on money and faith. And both of the parables that we're, we talked about last week and this week deal with money. But I begin in a different place. If you all remember the beginning of the month, I had an opportunity to go to a reunion. And this was a reunion of a performing group I was in back in the 70s and 80s called the Mini Singers. Uh, they were in Vallejo, and it was sort of a, if you remember the group Up With People, Lots of young, happy, smiling youth singing great songs and making everyone feel good. That's sort of what Mini Singers was. So I was in the group from 78 to 82 and um, had a great time. And we all came back together. And if you haven't found me in the front row, that's me right there. Um, I hated that yellow sweater. (laughs) But the great thing was we came back together and had this reunion. we went and had dinner together, got to see each other, and it was great. We had name tags because, you know, we've all changed in 30-something years, and uh, it was helpful to have those name tags. But after we had the dinner, we had a show that we could do. And I thought, heck, I'd love to sing, and so I sang with the band, and there was a master of ceremonies who came up and introduced himself and said, hey, uh, you're Dan Fowler, right? I remember you. And he said, my name's Leonard. And I looked at Leonard, And I didn't recognize him at all. And I said, nice to see you, Leonard. (laughs) Leonard went on to tell me that he was in the tech crew back when I was on stage in Mini Singers. And you see, there was a problem between the tech crew and those of us who were up on stage. We just didn't associate with one another. I didn't care about the tech crew. I didn't care about the lighting and the stage. I just cared about being up front and you know, getting all the applause and all that. So I really didn't give the people in the tech crew the time of day back then. I've gotten better, by the way. But when I saw Leonard, I just had no idea who he was. And I share that story because it reminds me a little bit about this parable of the rich man and the poor man who sat out in front at his gate every day 
And the rich man never paid attention. Maybe kind of like the, the people up on stage in the tech crew, or a, a wealthy man and a, and a poor beggar would never mix, never connect with one another. So for one reason or another, each day this rich man would go out through his door and would not pay attention to the man who was sitting there by the gates. So today we're going to look at this story and figure out what that says about uh, what Jesus calls us to be and figure out maybe who we're supposed to be in the story. Because in parables, Jesus always has us uh, to identify with one of the characters in the story. Now, we begin by a little shift in the audience. Last week, when we did the parable of the shrewd manager, the audience were the disciples. Now, Jesus is still in the same location, but now he shifts to the Pharisees. And in verse 14, just before this passage that Paula read, um, it says, according to Luke, that the Pharisees were lovers of money. And the teachings that Jesus has done, they're not too happy with. So let's take a look at why the Pharisees were so happy about their finances. Now, if you remember from last week, Jesus separated God and money, saying that you could not serve both God and money, or as we used to call it, mammon. This was a huge theological shift that the Pharisees didn't believe in. They believed that their wealth was a sign of God's favor. For example, Deuteronomy 28 verses 2 through 4 says, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your beasts and the increase of the cattle and the young of your flock. So, for the Pharisees, if you were faithful in following God's laws, you were therefore blessed financially by God. And that means it's okay to be wealthy. From their perspective, you didn't need to separate money and God for they were connected one to the other. Earthly riches were a sign of God's favor upon your life and therefore meant to be used as you saw fit. This is an important concept that Jesus challenges in today's parable. So let's take a look at the characters in the story. Let's begin with the rich man. Here is an example of one who has gained God's favor upon the earth, according to the Pharisees. From their perspective, he's blessed. He's a faithful man of God, a good example. He feasts scrumptiously every day, clothed in purple, fine linen cloth on his table and nice napkins. He's been blessed beyond measure and enjoys a comfortable, lavish, earthly life using God's blessings for himself. And this really is who they identify with in the story. If, as a sign of one's faithfulness, one gains wealth and riches from God, then the opposite must be true of our second character, the poor man, known as Lazarus. A poor person such as Lazarus must be sick because God is punishing him. The sores are there to teach him a lesson. He's also poor for a reason. He's being punished by God, stuck in his poverty because he has not been faithful to God. He doesn't even long after the rich man's daily banquet on his table, but instead hopes just for the food that falls from the meal. He lives out on the street, hangs out with the stray dogs who torment him by licking his sores and making his existence miserable. The poor man dies and is carried by the angels to be with the hero of the faith, Father Abraham in heaven. This is a surprise to the Pharisees. Why would this man who is being punished by God end up in eternity with the father of faith? The rich man also dies and is buried but ends up in Hades, also known as Sheol, the place of the dead. This, by the way, is different than hell. Why would this man who is a hero of the faith end up in the place of the dead? We read he is in torment. But he lifts up his eyes to heaven and sees Father Abraham who is cradling the poor beggar. And he finally pays attention to him and recognizes that this is the beggar who has been on his steps all that time. In the second half of the story, verses 27 through 32, 
The rich man pleads with Abraham for Lazarus to have mercy on his suffering and give him just a taste of water, for he is in fiery anguish in Sheol. Abraham reminds the rich man he had a lavish, comfortable life on earth, and now the tables have been turned. Furthermore, a great chasm was fixed between heaven and Sheol, making it impossible for Lazarus to even offer comfort. Then, perhaps for the first time, thinking about the needs of someone other than himself, he remembers he has five brothers. He pleads with Abraham for Lazarus to appear to warn the brothers who must also have been rich to change their ways lest they end up in torment when they die. Abraham tells the rich man that his brothers already have all they need. The scriptures should lead his brothers to help those in need. And if they don't follow the laws which are so plain, then even a supernatural visit from the grave won't make a difference. What are some of the laws of Abraham here for the five brothers' enlightenment? Well, consider Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. It says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not harvest your field to its very border. Neither shall you gather up the remaining gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the traveler. I am the Lord your God. Then there is Deuteronomy chapter 15 verses 7 through 8. If there is among you a poor brother or sister in any of your towns within your land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against them, but you shall open your hand to them and lend them what is sufficient for their need, whatever it may be. Then there are the words from the prophet Isaiah who wrote, Is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor to your house? Or consider King Solomon who wrote in Proverbs, Those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but those who are kind to the needy honor him. Jesus' point to the Pharisees is this. Do not neglect the poor and hungry in this world or there will be consequences in the next one. Financial favor in this life was meant to be shared with those in need, not hoarded and kept solely for one's own comforts. So back to the parable. With whom are we supposed to identify? Excluding Father Abraham, who is sort of a stand-in for God in this story, well, considering that both the rich man and the poor man have gone on to their eternal homes, the only ones left upon the earth are the five brothers. This parable serves as a wake-up call to us, we who are still here roaming upon the earth. We are those five siblings, and like them we have the laws of Moses and the words of the prophets. We have the scriptures to guide us. We have the teachings of Jesus who reminds us that when we see someone who is hungry or thirsty or a stranger or sick or without clothing or imprisoned, we see Jesus and we're called to reach out and help. We have these two parables from Jesus over the last two Sundays on wealth and faith. We have all we need. We are the five siblings of the rich man. St. Teresa once said, Poverty is not made by God. It is created by you and me when we don't share what we have. And so, we have all we need. The beggars are at our gates. The question is, will we recognize them as they are there? God be with us as we go from this place, given all that we have, we have all we need to take care of those who are outside our doors. And may we make it a goal here, now, to one day find ourselves in heaven in the bosom of Abraham. Hallelujah.
Amen. Let us have silence as we consider God's word for us this day. Let us pray. Oh God, open our eyes to the suffering of those around us, whether they be here in this community or somewhere in the world. Use our hands, our hearts, our voices, our finances to help bring your justice and your love and your mercy to those who are in need. Help us, Lord. You've given us all we need. May we read what you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen.